Hi guys and welcome back to Ashes Academy and I'm basically going to be trying to smash through as many 2020 papers as possible because this may help you with upcoming mocks etc and in your revision. So starting off with the paper one for the foundation paper of Edexcel. Please comment down below of which exam boards you want or which papers you want me to go through for GCSE and A-level maths and I'll try and go through as much as possible. So looking at question one. So it says write down the numbers in order of size starting with the smallest number okay so the first thing we're going to look at is the first decimal place so we can see that the three is the smallest so 0 0.4 is definitely not the smallest then we are going to look at the next decimal place we've got a two a five and a zero so zero is the least and so it's going to be our 0 0.309 first then two is next smallest so it'll be the 0 0.32 and then our 0 0.35, and then our 0 0.4. And then going over to question two, it says here's a list of numbers, and it wants us to write down a multiple of three. So our multiples of three, looking at this information, is our 18. There is no other multiple of three present. Then looking at the next question, it says write 4.666, correct to the nearest whole number so remember with your rounding up numbers look at the first decimal place and if it's greater than five then usually round up so we've got a six here so we're going to round this number up to five so that would be that answer and then we have right three quarters as a decimal so three quarters as a decimal would be 0.75 with these learn some of them and it'll make it easier like learn the half is equivalent to 0 0.5 and it'll just save your time in the exam then it says write down the value of the seven in the number 8765 so this is our units our tens hundreds thousands so the value of seven in this is going to be 700 Then looking at question six, it says that Gita spins a, a fair eight-sided spinner and it wants us on the probability scale to mark with a cross the probability that the spinner will land on C. So if we know that there's eight in total, eight options that she can land on, we're going to count how many C's there are. So there are one, two, three, and four. So there's four out of eight. We can simplify this fraction by dividing both top and bottom by two. This would leave us with two, sorry, with two over four, which we can divide top and bottom by two, which would leave us with a half. Or you could have just divided initially by four to leave you with a half. So we're going to draw the cross because that's what it wants on the half. And then it now says that on the probability scale, mark with a cross the probability that the spinner will land on D. So there is no D on this spinner, so it's going to be a zero out of eight probability, so it's just going to be zero. Then looking at question seven, it says that it it's given us an incomplete pictogram and basically wants us to complete it. So let's do it bit by bit. It says on Monday the shop sold 18 eggs, okay? and it says that the income shows okay on tuesday it sold 24 eggs wednesday it sold 27 so let's look at monday so monday it's got a whole one and it's got a half okay and it basically says the incomplete histogram shows information about the number of eggs sold from a farm on monday so we've got monday right so in total we've got one two three four five six Quarters. So we're going to do the 18 divided by 6 to see how many eggs is equivalent to the quarter on the histogram. I mean, sorry, on the pictogram. And that would be a 3. Okay, so our key is essentially telling us that in regards to this pictogram, a quarter is equal to 3. So a whole 1 would be 3 times 4, which is 12. So one of those whole circles would be 12. So the whole one is equal to 12 eggs. Okay, so you don't actually need to write that in the key. I'm just writing there just to um, make it easier. So now with Tuesday, it says that 24 eggs were sold. So 
24 divided by 12, because that's the whole one, is going to be 2. So we know that we need to dry, well, draw two ovals. Very badly drawn, <laughs> but two ovals, which, yeah, we could draw the quarter out. In the... Okay, so that's Tuesday done. Then Wednesday's got 27 eggs. So we're going to do 27 divided by 3, which is 9. So that means that we need a 9 of the quarters in there. So in one oval is four, and then in another oval is another four, and then we've only got eight at the moment, we need one more, so we're just going to draw one of the quarters. So that should be your pictogram filled in properly. Then having a look at question eight. So question eight is giving us a graph and it basically wants us to write down the coordinates of point eight. So remember with coordinates, you write the X value first and the Y value second. So our X is two, our Y is three. So it is going to be two, three. Then it says write down the coordinates of point B. So point B is here. So our X value for it is zero because it's along the zero part of the X axis. And our Y is minus one. Okay. And then lastly, it says on the grid, mark with a cross the point minus 2, 1 and label that C. So minus 2 for X would be along this point. And then it's minus 2, 1. So our 1 of our Y coordinate would be there. So where it now crosses, which would be here. So I'm going to now cross out all that drawing. So the point, therefore, would be there, and it wants us to label it C, so i label that C. Question 9 says the bag contains red containers and, sorry, red counters and blue counters. And it says the number of red counters to blue counters is a 3 to 4 ratio, and it wants us to write down the counters that are red as a fraction. So essentially, if we have a total of Adding the three and the four together gives us a total of seven counters. So essentially, out of those seven counters, three of them are red. So our fraction would be three out of seven. And then it says, write the ratio 12, 30 in the form one to n. So what we're going to do is, looking at our ratio, we are going to try and simplify this further. So we can divide both sides by two. That would leave us with 6 to 15. We can then divide both sides by 3. That would leave us with a 2 to 5 ratio. So then it wants us to leave it in the form of 1 and then n. So we're going to divide both sides by 2. Because by dividing by 2, this part would be equivalent to 1. So that will leave us with 1 on that side. And then 5 divided by 2 is the same as 5 over 2. But then as a number, that is the same as saying 2.5. So essentially, our final answer would be 1 to 2.5. Okay, moving on to the next question. Jenny has 12 marbles. A quarter of these marbles are large. The rest are small. Each large marble has a weight of 70 grams. Each small marble has a weight of 50 grams. It wants us to work out the total weight of the 12 marbles. So let's work out how many large ones we have and how many small ones we have. So the large ones is going to be a quarter of 12, aka a quarter times 12, which would leave you with an answer of three. So we have three large marbles. So it says each large marble weighs 70 grams. So we're going to do 70 times three which would leave you with 210 grams. So we know that large marbles come up to 210 grams. It says the rest of them are small. So if 3 out of 12 are large, that means to work out the small ones, we're going to do 12 minus 3, which would be 9. So we have 9 small marbles. Each weight of a small marble is 50 grams, so we're going to do 50 times 9, which would leave you with an answer of 450 grams. So that is for our small marbles, and then the total weight is going to be our 450, add our 210. So the zeros together is zero, 5 plus 1 is 6, and 4 plus 2 is also 6. So therefore, our to total weight is 660 grams. 
Okay, having a look at question 11. So it says that basically it wants us to reflect the shape in the mirror line. So when it comes to reflecting of shapes, I always count the distance from the shape to the actual mirror line. And then I want that same distance on the other side. So then from here to here is two squares. So that point would be there. Here to here is three. So then that would be there. And then from here to here is four squares. So it will be four squares on the other side. And then now, if the good thing when it comes to reflection is, luckily some people find it easier to just kind of be able to see the shape being formed. So then with a few points, you can be able to realize, oh, okay, that's what the shape would therefore be. Okay. So, diagram shows a number machine, and it wants us to find the output when the input is 7. So, let's chuck 7 in. Times it by 2, we get 14. Minus 3, we get 11. Find the input when the output is 41. So, if we're going backwards, everything is going to change. So, rather than minus 3, we're going to add 3. And rather than times by 2, we're going to divide by 2. So, if we put in 41, 41 plus 3 is 44. 44 divided by 2 is 22. So, remember, if you're going backwards, everything else in the machine will do the opposite. So, that's that question done. Okay. Moving on to question 13. So, question 13 says, find the bearing of B from A. Okay, so when it comes to our bearings, they are not that bare long, I promise you. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line from A to B. Okay, if it's the bearings of B from A, we need to start from the north of A, go round clockwise, because remember with bearings it's clockwise, and this is the angle we are going to work out. Okay, so now that we have that, you would then use your protractor. So you put your protractor on your, the paper on the actual question, and your protractor should give you an answer of around 25 degrees. But remember, with bearings, we always must leave our answers in three digits. So if you get a two digit angle, you need to add a zero to the front of it. So you would leave your answer as 025. The mark scheme, which I'll put down what the mark scheme allowed, the mark scheme did allow any value between 0 to 3, 0, 0 to 3 to 0 to 7 as your degrees. Okay, and it now wants us to work out the real distance between A and B. So what you would do is you would use your ruler to work out the distance from this point A to B. So use your ruler, and your ruler should give an answer of around 5 centimetres. Again, mark scheme allowed anywhere between 4.8 to 5.2 centimetres. And then with your 5 centimetres, bear in mind, it says the scale is a 1 to 25,000 um, scale. So you need to multiply that 5 centimetres by 25,000. So you do 5 times 25,000. So what I would do to make it easier is do 5 times 25, um, so to do it by multiplication this way, so that will be 5 carry the 2, hold on, 25, yes, that would be 5 carry the 2, and then the 5 times the 20 um, is going to be 100, plus the 2 there, so it will be 100. And 20 essentially so then 125 would be that answer so then what I would then do is write your 125 and stick on three zeros so then now you've got 125,000 but bear in mind that this scale what we've just converted is into centimeters so this 125,000 is actually like in terms of real life what the actual distance would be in centimeters but our answer needs to be in kilometers so a hat to go from centimeters to kilometers is if you first of all go from centimeters to meters because we know there's 100 centimeters in a meter so and to go from centimeters well convert centimeters to meters you would divide by 100 and then to go from meters to kilometers, 
because it's a thousand meters in a kilometer, kilo, thousand, so you can divide by a thousand. So if we divide by 100 first, it can move back to decimal places because it's two zeros and 100, we end up here. And then if we divide by a thousand, we move back three spaces, so one, two, three. So then we'd end up with 1.25 kilometers. This is very important because a lot of times people get the right answer but forget to convert into the units that they want. So please be aware. Okay, looking at this next question, Ishmael asked 30 students at college to tell them the sport that they each like best from cricket, tennis and swimming. It says 11 of the 20 female students said swimming, two of the male students said tennis and five students said cricket. The number of male students who said cricket was the same number of male students who said swimming. And it wants us to complete this two-way table. So in regards to this table, let's fill out based on the information they've given us, right? They're trying to help you in the exam. So it says 11 of the 20 female students said swimming. So 11 said swimming. Two of the male students said tennis. Five students said cricket. So this is five of both genders that will go in the total there. Okay, so we've got that. And then it says the same, the number of male students who said cricket was the same number of male students who said swimming. So what we now need to do is break down this information based on what we have. So we know that there's 30 students in total and 20 of them are female. So therefore, there's going to be 10 male students because if we take away 30, well, if we do 30, take away 20, we end up with 10. So we know we've got 10 male students. So the number of male students playing cricket and swimming are the same. So if we do 10 minus 2, we get 8. Divide by 2 is 4. So we're going to have 4 here and 4 there. So that means our total student swimming is going to be the 4 plus 11, which is 15. Total student, well, the female student playing cricket is going to be 5, take away the 4 of the male playing cricket, which is just 1 female student playing cricket and then we know that there's 20 female students in total so to work out the number of female students playing tennis we are going to do 20 minus the one playing cricket minus the 11 swimming so then that would leave us with an answer of eight so that's eight female students playing tennis and then the total number of students playing tennis is eight plus two which will be ten and just to cross check everything's right just make sure that you just check that all the totals everything adds up to the correct total so 15 plus 10 is 25 plus 5 which is 30 looks good the 10 at the top's all right and the 20 at the bottom's all right and all these totals at the bottom look okay as well all right so next question, Jamil makes a drink by mixing one part of orange squash with nine parts of water. He uses 750 milliliters of orange juice or orange squash and Jamil is going to put the drink he has mixed into one liter bottles. Work out the greatest number of one liter bottles that Jamil can completely fill. Okay, so let's break this down bit by bit. So we know the ratio of the squash to water is a one to nine ratio. He wants to make, well, he uses 750 mils of orange squash. So we can work out how much um, water he uses for that. So for every like one part of orange squash, you've got nine parts of water. So essentially, to get from one to that is times by 750. So you wanna do the same thing on the other side. So we're going to do 750 times by 9. So we get 0 from that part. 9 times 5, which is 45. Carry the 4. 9 times 7, which is 63. Plus the 4, which is 67. So now we've got 6,750 mils of water. So what we're then going to do is we are going to add those two values together. So then you're going to have 650. 6,750 plus 750, which would be 0, 0 carry the 1, then you've got 14 plus 1, which is 15, carry the 1, so you've got 7. So we've he can make, well, he makes essentially 7,500 mils of this mixture drink. So we're going to convert this mils into litres. So dividing 7,500 by 1,000, because that's what you do to convert milliliters to liters, you'd end up with, okay, move back three spaces, one, two, three, end up with 7.5 liters 
of this mixture. But we need to work out the greatest number of one litre bottles that he completely fills. This 0.5 is not going to completely fill the bowl. So realistically, he can only fill seven bottles of one, seven one litre bottles of this drink that he makes. Next question says, the table gives information about the number of points scored by each of the each of 16 students in a game. It says, Tina works out that the mean of the number of points scored to be five, okay? And we have to explain why it is not possible for the median to be five. Okay, so the maximum points scored is four. <laughs> five is not even showing in this table, okay? So you could say something along the lines of, therefore, no one... scored five points so that's one thing you could have said um another thing you could have said is if we actually worked out the median we know our median is our middle value so we've got 16 students in total so remember median you do 16 your total number of people plus one over two so that'll be 17 over two which is 8.5 so we are looking for between the eight to the ninth value out of the results. So this would be one, one plus the three, which would be four, four plus the five, which is nine. So the eighth to ninth value is between this row where they score two points. So we know our median is two. So that's another thing you could say. You could say because the median is actually two. And lastly, you could say, again, something along the lines of the number of points only goes up to four. So either of those points, you don't have to make note of all of them because it's only a one mark question. Um, but any of those reasonings are acceptable. Um, OK, so it also says that Tina has also worked out the total number of points scored by the 16 students in the game. Here is her working out, okay, and it says Tina has made a mistake in her working to find the total number of points scored, and we need to describe the mistake that Tina has made. Oh, Tina Turner. Okay, so, first of all, let's have a look. So, she is right in the sense of we're going to multiply the number of points by the frequency. So, I'll put n for points times frequency. So, zero times one, which would leave you with an answer of zero, Tina. <laughs> and then one times three, which is three, so she's right in that sense. Two times five, which is 10. Three times four, which is 12. And then four times three, which is also 12. Okay, so she didn't make any other errors, okay, which is not too bad, like she did all right. But the main problem is, is that zero times one is actually zero, not one. So this is the mistake that Tina makes. So. Zero times one is zero, not one. So anything along those lines, or you could have said anything times zero is zero. They also accepted that, etc. Um, but yeah, they did not accept though in the mark scheme um, that the correct answer is thirty-seven as an explanation. Uh -uh, do not say that. The reason why is because that's not really explaining the error that she's made within the actual calculation. So that's what they were looking for. Okay, so. Question 17. In a shop, it says that a TV has a normal price of £500. The shop has a sale. So on Monday, the normal price of the TV is reduced by a tenth to give the sale price. On Tuesday, it's reduced by 20%. And, well, the sale price is reduced by 20%. That's the key point. Chris wants to buy the TV. He has £400 to spend on the TV. Does Chris have enough money to buy the TV on Tuesday? Well, let's break it down. So TV price is £500. Okay, it's reduced by a tenth. A tenth is basically known as ten percent in a percentage. So it's reduced by ten percent. So that means that the price now is actually ninety percent of the actual price. Because if you do a hundred as the original normal price, take away the ten percent, you're left with ninety percent. So we're going to work out ninety percent of five hundred pounds. Which a way of doing that is doing five hundred divided by ten times by nine. So 500 divided by 10 would leave you with an answer of 50, 50 times 9, which is 450 pounds. So that's the price on Monday now. 
Tuesday is 20% reduced from the sale price. So again, our sale price now is going to be equal to our 100%, which means the new price is going to be 80% of the sale price, okay, because we've taken off 20% is reduced by 20%. So in order to work out 80% of 450, again, you could do 450 divided by 10 times by 8. So remove the zero top and bottom, so you're left with 45 times 8, and then that would leave you with, so 40 times 8 is 320 plus, so we could actually do it this way, just to make life easier. So 5 times 8, 40. Carried 4, 4 times 8, 32, plus the 4, 300, well, 36. So you're left with 360 pounds. So the actual price is 360 pounds on Tuesday. So Chris, my friend, has enough money. So our answer is going to be yes. Yes, Chris has enough money. As the price on Tuesday is £360, which is less than £400. Ka-ching, well done, Chris. All right, so next question, work out an estimate for 790 times 289 divided by 49. So first thing that we are going to do is round these numbers up to nicer numbers. So 790, we can round up to 800. 289, we can round up to 300, and 49, we can round up to 50. Nicer numbers, right? So 8 times 3 is 24. Of course, we've got 2 zeros here, 2 zeros here. That's 4 zeros, so we're going to stick on those 4 zeros, divided by 50. We can cross out our 0 at the bottom and our 0 at the top. So that would leave us with 24,000 divided by 5. So what we can do now is we can actually split this up to kind of make our life easier. So 20,000 divided by 5 is going to be 4,000. Then the 4,000 divided by 5 is going to be 800. So add those together so you're left with 4,800 as your final answer. And the mark scheme allowed any answer between 4,555 to 4,800. Oh, just got there. Okay. So, right, next question is a bit of algebra. So, it wants us to expand the brackets. So, what we're going to do is, on the outside times everything on the inside. So, x times x is x squared. x times minus 4 is going to be minus 4x. Then it wants us to factorise 15y minus 10. So the common factor between them is 5, because 5 goes into 10 and 15. So 5 is going to go on the outside of the brackets. Then we're going to divide everything by 5. So 15y divided by 5 would leave us with an answer of 3y. And then minus 10 divided by 5 would be minus 2. So that's our final answer for that one. And then solving C, so it's now said that 7 brackets F minus 5 close bracket is equal to 28. So first thing we're going to do is expand our brackets. So we'll end up with 7F minus 35 is equal to 28. Then we can add 35 to both sides just to remove it from that side to leave F on its own. Because um, remember when you're solving, you're trying to work out what the letter is equal to. You. So then 28 plus 35 quickly work out because remember this is a non-calculated paper. So 5 plus 8, 13, carry the 1. So 3 carry the 1. 3 plus 2 is 6. Plus, sorry, 3 plus 2 is 5 plus the 1 which is 6. So we've got 63. So then we know 7f is equal to 63 and then divide both sides by 7. 63 is divided by 7 would be 9. So f is equal to 9. Question 20, so it's given us an arithmetic um, sequence and it wants us to write down an expression in terms of n for the nth term. So the first thing you do with arithmetic sequences is work out the distance between your terms. So you've got 3 there, 3 there, 3 there, 3 there. Oh, that's constant. So that constant difference, we multiply that by n, so we've got 3n. Then if we work out our first 
I always go with three because three is a nice number. Work out your first values of three n when n is equal to one, two, and three. So three n when n is one will be three. Then you've got six. Then you've got nine. Our terms at the moment are one, four, and seven. So we need to work out the difference of three n from the actual numbers in our terms. So to go from three to one, you would minus two. To go from three to four, you would minus two and nine to seven. Sorry, to go from six to four, you minus two. To go from nine to seven, you minus two. So therefore, our final answer would be three n minus two. Then it wants us to show that this is equal to this. So first thing we're going to do is change our top, um, what's it called? our fractions into top heavy fractions. Okay. So remember when we're changing mixed numbers into top heavy fractions, you would times the whole number by the denominator and plus one of the numerator um, to give us the actual numerator. The denominator is not going to change. So two times three is six plus one, which is seven. Then on the other one, three times four is 12 plus three, which is 15. And the denominator does not change. Then we're going to work out 15. Well, we're going to solve multiplying these fractions. So remember, when it comes to multiplying fractions, you times the numerators together and you times the denominators together. So 7 times 15, so 15 plus 7. So 5 times 7, which is 5, but carry the 3 because 35. And then the 1 times 7, which is 7, plus 3, which is 10. So that's going to be 105, 3 times 4, which is 12. So now that we've got this, we now need to work out our new, I like the actual value written as a mixed number. So we need to think of how many times 12 kind of goes into 105. So how we can do this is, what I know is 12 times 8, this is 96. And so therefore we could have 8 and then our 12. But if I do my 105 minus 96, I end up with 4, 9. So then now I've got 9 twelfths. I can simplify that fraction by dividing both top and bottom by 3. So then therefore I'm left with 8 and then the fraction is 4 on the bottom and 3 on the top. So that's how I've shown that. Okay, so looking at question 22, so it's basically showing us these different graphs and it says that each of the equations, if I zoom out even more so you can see the full question. Okay, so it says each of the equations in the table is an equation of one of the graphs and wants us to complete the table. All right, let's have a look at what we have. Let's look at the y equals x squared because that's a nice quadratic graph. So which one looks like our quadratic? Def o d. Quadratics is always like your u shape kind of graph so you know that one's d cubic is more of like the kind of weird s shape so we've got y equals x cubed so then that would be kind of this one because that one's got that shape so then that would be our graph c over there then y equals minus x cubed if you've got a negative it's going to be like the other way around so this one kind of looks like that so that one's going to be b and then the last one rather than us assume it's a let's have a look so we've got a reciprocal graph Okay, one over x. And reciprocal graphs do give that appearance. They love to give that appearance of, you know, just that shape. So therefore, we can agree that A is at the bottom. Okay, looking at question 23. So it says, these two of these triangles are congruent. And it wants us to write down the letters of these two triangles. So remember, congruent in maths means they are the same. So let's have a look at which ones are possibly the same. So how we could tell is with triangles that are the same, the length that they have and the opposite angles would be the same. So let's look at our 10 centimetres, because 10 centimetres is labelled on all of them. So with triangle C, it's got 10 centimetres, and the angle opposite is 55. Can we see any other triangle that's got that? Nah, because this one's 10 centimetres and 45 degrees. This one's 10 centimetres and 80 degrees. But we don't know what this one is, okay? So how we know it is, 
The missing angle would be 80 degrees. They've kind of given you the clue, but we can double check just to see the answer's right. So we're going to do 180 minus 45 plus 55. So 45 plus 55 is 100. So 180 minus 100 is 80 degrees. So we can confirm that's the angle. So the only one with 10 centimeters and 80 degrees opposite is our D. So that is the easiest method I could probably give you to work out these congruent triangles. So the two answers may be A and D. So Sean pays £10 for 24 chocolate bars. Wow. And basically it says that he sells all 24 chocolate bars for 50p each. We need to work out his profit. Okay, so if he's selling them for 50p each, so that's zero point written as that in pound times 24, aka half of 24. So, because 0.5 is the same as a half, so half of 24 is 12. So, essentially, my guy's made 12 pounds, which is all right. It's all right, Sean. So, in order to work out his profit, you're going to do how much he made, take away how much he spent on the stock, which is 10 pounds, divided by the total stock that he had, well, total stock that he spent, which was £10, times by 100, because we're dealing with percentages here. So 12 minus 10, which is 2. 2 out of 10 times 100. So that would leave you with 2 out of 10 is 0 0.2 times 100. Move forward two spaces, stick a zero on the end. You're left with 20. So he's made 20% profit. Not bad, Sean, not bad. Okay, looking at question 25, we've got a triangle ADC. So it says AD and ABC are straight lines. EB is parallel to DC. It's giving us angles and it wants us to work out the size of angle EAB. So I was going in the direction. So EA to B. So I know it's therefore that angle. Or another hack that some people like to do is the angle of the middle letter. So we're trying to work out what this angle is. So, okay, let's break down what we have bit by bit. This is going to be using some of our angles in parallel lines rules. So let's get right into it. So the first thing that we can see is got to be a co-anterior angles going on, don't we? So <laughs> we've got that. And also bear in mind, this one is on a straight line. So First thing we can do is angles on a straight line. Straight line. Add up to 180 degrees. So therefore, to work out what this piston length is, we'll do 180 minus 148. And that should leave you with an answer of 32 degrees. So we know that one is 32 degrees then the next thing that we can do is that we can use the rule let's zoom out for more space that co-interior angles add up to 180 degrees so we've got 63 degrees here so the angle here is going to be 180 degrees minus 63 degrees and that will leave us an answer of 117 degrees. So we know that's 117 degrees. Bring this straight. Okay, so then to work out what this angle is, again, angles on a straight line add up to 180 degrees. So 180 degrees minus 117 degrees would leave us with 63. <laughs> So this would also be 63 degrees. Another way of working that out could have been, if we draw it out, if you can see that F shape, so the rule of corresponding angles are equal. So now that's 63 degrees. So now we've got 63, 32. We need to work out Emerson and length. And it's in a triangle. And the last point that you're going to make is because angles in a triangle add up to 180 degrees so 180 minus our 63 plus 32 would leave us with the answer of the angle we're trying to work out 
So 63 plus 32 would be 95. So it's going to be 118 minus 95, which would leave us with an answer of 85 degrees. Okay, so that's that answer done. And notice how I wrote down the reasoning. I didn't just write it down for the sake of you guys to understand. I wrote it down because the question specifically says, give a reason for each stage of your work analysis. It's very crucial. Okay. So question 26 says that the table um, shows information about the heights in centimetres of a group of year nine girls. And it's given us a stem and leaf diagram. So... It wants us to compare the distribution of the heights of the girls with the distribution of the heights of the boys. So the boys have been given as a stem and leaf. The girls have been given in a table. So let's try and compare. So the first thing we can do is the girls has given us the median, the least height, and the greatest height. So we can work out those for the boys. Let's stick a box up there. So the least height, which I'm going to put as LH for the boys, is our... 158 okay centimeters the greatest height for the boys is 182 centimeters and now our median so median remember is the total number of people you have so we've got a group of 15 boys so 15 plus the one divided by two which would leave us with an answer of 16 divided by two which is eight so we're looking for the eight values so that's one two three four five six and then eight so it's 168 centimeters okay let's compare so we could say that on average the boys are taller because their median is bigger also you could say something along the lines of the greatest height um for the boys is 182 centimeters whereas for the girls it's 170 centimeters so anything along those lines should be fine. So we're going to do that now. So because now, bear in mind, usually with these questions, it will ask you to like compare one thing because it's like a one marker. But bear in mind, this is a three mark question. So we're going to compare all three things. Okay, so first of all, on average, because remember median is a type of average, the boys are taller as the median is 168 centimeters whereas the girl's median equals 165 centimeters the greatest height For boys is 182 centimeters, whereas the girl's greatest height is 170 centimeters, and lastly, the least height for the boys is 158 centimeters whereas for the girls it is 150 centimeters okay so that's basically our comparison for that but the last thing that we haven't done is worked out the ranges so the range for the girls would be 170 minus 150 which is 20 and the range for the boys is 182 minus 158, which would leave us with an answer of 24. <laughs> so again, the range for the boys is also bigger as well. So you can say the range for the boys is 24, whereas for the girls, is 20. So yeah, the mark scheme allows for you to compare the range, um, the range of the girls, range of the boys, or median of the boys for one mark. Two marks if you correctly compare to the median and compare the ranges, and at least another mark would be comparison of medians or ranges that could, so yeah, if you just compared your median, your range, 
Um, but yeah, simply quoting them is insufficient. You actually need to compare um, the actual values between them. So yeah, by saying that one is less, one is more. Um, so essentially, we can say that the boys were taller, medium was bigger. The range for the boys was more than the girls and also saying comparing about the heights as well so make sure that don't just say that for this one is for this one okay it's more of a thing of okay you found that which one is taller or which one is bigger which one's smaller so make sure you compare properly and then looking at question 27 so 27 shows a prism placed on a horizontal floor it's given us the height the volume and it said the pressure on the floor due to the prism is 75 newtons per meter squared it wants us to work out the force okay it's given us the formula <laughs> lucky lucky that you don't have to learn that so for force if we rearrange this it would be force is equal to area okay. times pressure so we actually don't know the area, we know the, the volume of this prism. So in order to work out the area, the easiest way is volume for any shape like this is always the area of the cross section. So area of cross section meaning like the face, the area of the face of the shape times by the height. So if we've got the volume, which is 18, area we don't know, so we call that X. Height we do know is 3, so something times 3 is 18, so therefore 18 divided by 3 would give us our area, which is 6 centimetres squared. So we have our area, which is 6, our pressure is giving us 75, so you're going to do 75 times 6. So 5 times 6, 30, so 0 carried the 3, 6 times 7, which is 42, plus the 3, which is 45. So you've got a force of 450. Newtons. Then the next question, it says write these numbers in order of size, starting with the smallest. Okay, so when it comes to standard form, um, tends to be the smaller the value, the more negative or closer to zero is. So here we've got three of them in standard form, but one of them's not. So to make it easier to compare, we're going to convert this in standard form. So the fact that it's a small, small number is going to give us an indication that it's going to be times 10 to the power of a negative value. We've got the 6, 7, and 2. So standard form, the number that times by 10 has to be between 1 and 9.99. So a number that we can make between that range can be 6.72. Don't just put 6.7, put all the numbers there. Um, and then lastly, to work out what the actual number is, is we're going to go back from, oh, not from there, sorry about, we're going to go from here to where the dot would be for 6.72. So that's one space, two space, three, four. So it's going to be to the minus four. Okay, so now that we have this, lastly, these two are also not correctly written in standard form, so we need to change. So with this one, we're going to move back one space. So remember, because it's to a negative power, negative powers are already moving back. So if we're moving closer to what the actual number is, we're actually going to add one to the power. So then it will be 6.7, because it's like, you know, less distance needed. So it'll be 6.72 times 10 to the minus 3. This one we're changed to, so we're moving back two spaces. So again, this is a big number. So if we're moving back more, then you're going to need a bigger number to the power. So it will be add 2. So there will be 6.72 times 10 to the power of 6. So we can see our smallest number is our, well, smallest power is our 10 to the minus 4. So the smallest number will be this one. Remember, write the numbers in the form that they actually gave it to you in, not what you converted it to be. So that's our first one. Then the next smallest power is our 10 to the minus 3 over here. So it will be this one. So 67.2 times 10 to the minus 4. And then the next smallest number is this one. And then our next smallest one is, well, the biggest one is our 672 times 10 to the power of 4. 
Okay, question 29, it says, given that A over B is equal to 2 over 5 and B over C is 3 quarters, it wants us to find A to B to C. So, essentially, looking at the fractions, we can say that A is equal to 2 and B is equal to 5, okay? And then, now, we've got B over C is equal to 3 quarters. So, if we've got the B is equal to 5 there, but here we've got B is equal to 3 and C is equal to 4. We need to make these Bs in common so it's easier to compare it to our A to our C. So a common multiple between 5 and 3 is 15. So therefore, we're going to times these numbers by 3 and these ones by 5. So 2 times 3 would give us an A value of 6 and our B is equal to 15. Then here, b is equal to 15, which is written, but c would now be equal to 20. So now we've got a 6 to 15 to 20 ratio. We're going to try and find a common factor now to write these numbers down to see if we can simplify this further. But unfortunately, we cannot because they don't all share a common factor together. So 2 doesn't go into but all of them, 3 doesn't go into all of them, even 5 doesn't go into all of them, so that's the simplified answer. So it's just 6 to 15 to 20. And last question of the day. So it says make Q the subject of P is equal to 6Q plus 7. So remember, whenever you're rearranging the equation, there's two ways I think of it. Either like you deduct the same number on both sides or add the same, do whatever to both sides, or think of the equal sign as a fence, which I explained in my video on changing the subject. Think of the equal sign as a fence and you're moving everything over except Q to leave it alone. So if I want to move plus seven over, it's going to end up, when it moves over the fence, it becomes the opposite of what it was. So it would end up being P minus seven is equal to six Q. And then here I've got essentially, when you've got a number and a letter next to each other, they're multiplying. So this multiply six, if I move it over, is going to become divide by six. So I'm going to end up with P minus 7 over 6 is equal to Q. Then lastly, it wants us to simplify N to the power of minus 2 um, times, well, to the power of minus 3. So whenever you've got brackets and indices, you essentially times the two powers together. So it's going to be M minus 2 times minus 3. The minuses will cancel out 2 times 3 is 6, so you'll be left with m to the power of 6. And that comes to the end of this paper. I hope this was useful for those of you watching. Please comment down below for more content or any suggestions. And yeah, subscribe, like, share, all that jazz. And thank you guys.